Jensen's log. Start at 42.112.3. Starfleet Academy. I have been selected to go on a cultural exchange program to Klingon space. I'll be travelling to Kronos and be experiencing firsthand the very best of Klingon literature, fashion, art, and entertainment. <laughs> However, I fear that I may have misrepresented my qualifications just a little bit in my application. I claimed that I had a degree in Klingon language. However, I really only have a degree in computer science. However, I have been working on the Universal Translator project for the last few months, and it seems to be going pretty well right now, so I'm sure that will get me by. Engine's log. Stardate 42117.4. Trauma Recovery Ward. <laughs> there appears to be a translator problem. It seems to understand the language just fine, but for some reason I seem to encounter all of these cultural difficulties. Um, very recently I tried to order a drink and I spoke to the translator the English phrase, give me a beer please. Now the translator decided to translate this as follows. Forgive me, it decided to say knob, which is the Klingon phrase for you give me, a very, very useful phrase to learn. For beer, it translated ikwe which is blood wine, the local equivalent of beer, and not a bad drink overall. But the real problem came when I got to the word please. It insisted on translating the word please as pijub ej kikuk, which means I am weak, Ensign's Lock. Start at 42.120.4. Starport Bar. Nobody here will serve me a drink. Nobody. At best, they ignore me. At worst, they laugh at me. But nobody will give me anything to drink. I'm sure that I've got the phrasing right. I've been saying, give me a beer. I now know to avoid the word please whenever speaking in Klingon. The translator then gives me the very useful phrase, ikwe hik hik nob, please gi or give me blood wine, but then it insists on adding the phrase, binich if you want to. It seems to have this strange opinion that whenever I'm speaking in, in English, I must be being polite. And this doesn't seem to work in Klingon. Ends and log. Start at 42.122.8. Detox app patients. <laughs> I have finally discovered the correct phrasing in order to get a drink. What I need to say to the translator is give me a beer or die. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing is that this produces the phrase ikwe hek hek nob, which is simply give me blood wine. The interesting thing about the Klingon phrase is that the or die is completely implicit. <laughs> if you are not going to be served a drink in a Klingon bar, of course there's going to be violence. Ensign's log. Start at 42.128.5. Extreme programming conference. Klingons give a whole new phrase, a whole new meaning to the phrase extreme programming. In fact, the threat of implicit violence seems to permeate all aspects of Klingon life. And this includes their programming languages. There seems to be a Klingon programming proverb, which goes a little bit like this. Oh, crap. <laughs> As soon as you fail, do not return. Die. Although in English, would probably translate this as it is better to die in the attempt than to return in failure. 
I tried to explain to my colleagues at this conference that I was using my favorite programming language, which was Perl. Unfortunately, my colleagues thought that I was trying to say Perl, which unfortunately is the Klingon order to be violent. <laughs> After I had recovered from my injuries, I managed to convince my colleagues that no, really, I was programming in Perl. And they all laughed at me. I didn't understand why. Eventually, I realized that to Klingons, Perl is a pujui. Perl is weak. And the reason why Perl is weak is because everything in Perl returns in failure. To give you an example, if I were to write this line of code in Perl, that's how I open a file. But what it really means is open this file if you want to. In order for me to properly open a file in Perl, I need to say open this file or die. <laughs> Once again, I seem to be fighting the translator, but this time with my favorite programming language. Now, Perl doesn't seem to have any sort of native Klingon semantics, which makes it very, very hard to introduce to Klingon programmers, although I've noticed that some of its modules do. The database module in Perl does have Klingon semantics. Now, when most people program using DBI, they write something look, which looks like this. Connect to my database or die. Then prepare my statement or die. <laughs> then execute my statement or die. <laughs> then process all of my rows. And then if I remember, and a lot of people forget, I check for an error and die. So where are the Klingon semantics in that? Well, the Klingon semantics in that code don't exist. Where, you come, where they come into play is when I pass arguments to the DBI module. So I can say, please connect to my database, but with raise error turned on. Raise error says that if there are any sorts of problems whatsoever, automatically raise an exception, which will normally kill my program. Also, I want to enable show error statement to be true. This means if there are any sorts of problems, I get the SQL statement that caused them. Now, I can just prepare my statement, execute my statement, and then do my work. And there's no need for an or die. So that's fantastic, but what about Perl's built-ins? Do Perl built-ins come with any sort of Klingon semantics at all? Pagna. None at all. But really, who cares? I'm not programming in Klingon. I don't I'm not going to spend very long in Klingon space. Most of my colleagues are not Klingons. So who cares whether or not there are native Klingon semantics? Well, let's look at what happens without them. Here, I'm opening up my file. And then here is the error code I need to make sure that that was successful. Do notice that my error code is much, much bigger than my real code. It also means that bugs are very, very easy to introduce. If I were to simply write, open my file, this means open my file if I want to. And of course, that's usually going to be a bug in Perl. And it gets worse. I could have a subroutine which returns a file handle, which is what I'm doing here. To give you an idea of what that subroutine might look like, I can say, I take a file name, I walk through a list of directories and try to open up the file in each directory, and then as soon as I find a successful uh, file that I can open, I'm going to return that file handle. The problem with this subroutine here is that if it fails, it's going to return the undefined value. And the code which is using this subroutine isn't checking for the undefined value. Instead, it's passing it through to another subroutine, here I've called read header. It takes that, expecting a real file handle, tries to read from it, and I end up with a warning at this line here. Now that may be hundreds or thousands of lines away from where the error actually occurred, and it might be in a completely different file. Damien Conway, in his book Pearl Best Practices, calls this sideways propagation, and it really, really sucks. So, wouldn't it be nice if we could get Perl to generate errors for us? Wouldn't it be nice if we could make Perl hoswi, make Perl strong? Well, we can. 
Pearl comes with a module and has come for absolutely years with this module called Use Fatal. What Use Fatal does is it allows us to say for any Pearl built in, for almost any Pearl built in, it's going to have Klingon semantics. To do that, I simply say Use Fatal Open. Now I will automatically open or die. To give you an example, there I am, open or die in Perl. But what about the error messages that we get from Fatal? Well, those error messages are not exactly ideal. Here's the error message that I would normally write myself. That's what I would like to see. Here's the error message that I get from Fatal. That's not something you want to show to your end users. In fact, I think for most of my users, even those who don't speak Klingon, this is going to be a more useful error message for them. <laughs> and it just gets worse. The reason is that Fatal has package-wide scope. Now, what this means is that I might be doing something in my program, opening up my file, or recovering. So here, I don't want to automatically die. I want to do my own recovery code if something goes wrong. Then I might have hundreds of lines of code in my file. And then down here, I can have a subroutine. The subroutine is using Fatal because it wants this final open to automatically have Klingon semantics. The problem is that this changes not only the open at the bottom of my code, but also the open all the way up there. And if that ever occurs to you, it's very, very hard to debug. It sucks in weird and terrible ways. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's fix it. Having gone to Klingon Space and having learnt from their very finest programmers and having mended my bones afterwards, I have developed the Autodie Pragma, which has a good Klingon name, Autodie. Rather than using Fatal, anywhere that you'd normally use Fatal, now, you can simply use Autodie. If you use Autodie, it works the same way as Fatal, except that it has lexical scope. That means that whenever you use Autodie, it lasts until the end of the current block, file, or eval. So, to take my example before, here I am opening my file or recovering. Then I've got my hundreds of lines of code, but now when I'm inside my subroutine, I can you simply use Autodie for open. And that auto die only changes the open inside the same block. It doesn't change any other open anywhere else in my code. So it's much, much safer to use. It's got a much more refined effect. It also gives me much, much better error messages as well. So rather than getting this really quite disgusting message, which you get back from Fatal, auto die gives you something which is much closer to what you'd write yourself. Can't open some file.txt for reading, no such file or directory, and here's where the error occurred. Fatal also has another problem which you might encounter, and that's this. When I'm using Fatal, I need to specify all of the things that could go wrong. So here I've said use Fatal, open, close, chdir, and rename. All of those things might fail. Then I'm going to have an eval where I'm going to try and do some code. If you've come from other programming languages, eval is pretty much the same as try in Perl. So I'm going to try to change directories, try to open a file, try to rename a file. The problem is that when I get down here to my error handling, this is a catch in Perl. When I'm trying to do my error handling, how do I know what failed? How do I know what went wrong? Unfortunately, Perl's error object is just going to be a simple string, and it's going to be one of those ugly strings that I've seen from Fatal. With autodie, this becomes much, much easier. First of all, I don't need to say use autodie and then supply a list. If I simply use autodie, it turns it on for all of Perl's built-ins by default, or all the ones which could possibly fail. Then I simply try to do my work, and now, given that particular error, I can see what sort of error I had. This is assuming that you're using Perl 5.10. In Perl 5.8, there are similar syntax which you can use. So given the error, when it was undefined, there wasn't an error. When it matches open, I know that it's an error from open. When it matches the class of I.O. errors, I know it's some sort of an I.O. error. I -O error. And when it matches the class of all errors, I know it was some other sort of autodie error. In any other situation, it must be some sort of legacy error. It wasn't an error from autodie. 
Now this here is much, much handier when you're trying to figure out what went wrong and how do you recover from that. But it gets even better because I have deep inspection of that error which occurred. So here I'm going to take my error and give it a more meaningful name. But I can find out the subroutine that died, the subroutine that I was trying to call. I can find out what was trying to call that. I can find out what line number that occurred at, what file it occurred at, which package it occurred at. So I've got all this incredibly useful information for debugging. I can even pull out things like the C error number. So what was the specific type of error that occurred? And I can even get a list of arguments which were passed to the subroutine. So I can actually say what was the file name that I was trying to open. And of course, if I simply use my error like a string, I get that pretty printed message that I showed you before. Majqua. <laughs> Catch me, Yeloshku. <laughs> now, let's pretend that we're working with some system administration tasks. A lot of people use Perl for system administration and they end up with things which look like this. So mount some directory, then make my backups, then delete some archives. Note that it's very, very important that I don't go on to the next step unless the previous step actually worked. Unless I mounted my directory, I can't make my backups. Unless I made my backups, I sure as hell don't want to change or delete those old files. But how do I know if this actually worked? Well, the one thing which I can't do in Perl is I can't say system or die. The reason is that system is the only built-in in Perl that returns false on success and returns true on failure. So instead, you could write system and die. But this also has its own problems. If I say system and die, and I try to use this funny looking error dollar question mark, which a lot of people do, you end up with an error message that looks like this. 4096 at backup.pl line 53. You large bay? <laughs> 4096, what on earth does that mean? 4096 is actually the real exit status, right shifted by eight. <laughs> Apparently, this is friendly to C programmers who have used the wait PID call. I only know two people have used that and they both hate it. <laughs> so what's the recommended way of doing this? Well, according to the Perl documentation, what you'd find in Perl doc or what you'd find in the camel book, whenever you write this, which executes a command, you should follow it up with some error handling code. The error handling code looks like this. Yeah, blah. That's some um, English, <laughs> not Klingon. So can autodie help us here? It can. We can say use autodie system, which like any other Perl built in, means do this or die. So now when I do a system mount backup and it fails, I automatically get something like this. Mount backup unexpectedly returned value 16 at your script.pl line 8. If I want to, I can even say, well, there are certain exit values that I'm expecting, and they're OK. And to do that, I simply pass in an extra argument of exit values at the front. So now 0 and 16 exit values are OK. Anything else, any other exit value, gives me back an error or if it dumps core, or if it's killed by a signal, or if some other problem occurs. I couldn't start the program. In fact, Autodie has extra smarts for all of these Perl built-ins, where a standard do this or die would not technically be correct. Fork, for example, will return zero to the parent process. So you can't just do a fork or die because then you're, sorry, return zero to the child process. So you can't just do a fork or die because then your children always die. But what about non-core subroutines? What if I've got somebody else's subroutine that likes to return false or likes to return undef to indicate failure? Well, let's take a look at some of those. Some of you may have used the file copy module before. File copy allows you to copy files. It's really, really handy. It comes standard with Perl. And that's how I copy a file. However, that's how I check to see whether or not the file was actually successfully copied. So I'm doing a lot more work again to check my errors rather than just copy my file around. If I want to, I can use Autodie. And it doesn't need to be a Perl built-in. It can be something from another module if I want to. So use Autodie copy, and now I just copy from here to there. And it's much, much cleaner. 
If I have a problem, it automatically generates an error message for me. And the error message is quite useful. Can't copy this file to that file, no such file or directory. And again, where the problem occurred. If I want to restore that original uh, behavior, so if I want to say copy a file if you want to, I can always turn it off as well. This works both for Perl built-ins and for other people's programs. So no auto die copy, and then copy this file if you want to. But just for this block of code, because they all have lexical scope. You can control all of this on a per block basis. It's also possible, if I want to, to subclass auto die. So let's pretend that you don't like the name. Um, when I first proposed the idea of auto die to the Perl 5 porters list, we had this huge bike shedding. I don't know if people are familiar with the phrase bike shedding, but you say, hey, I want to build a bike shed, and then rather than giving useful feedback on you know, how many bikes it should hold or doing case studies, everyone wants to say what color it should be. So that's what occurred on Perl 5 porters. They said it should be called lethal because it can kill your program. Or it should be called lethargy because it can allow you to be lazy. Or they could be called kvetching because it lets your things complain. And then things started getting silly. They wanted to call it unforgiving or my personal favorite from the Pearl 5 pumpkin at the time, bitchin' built-ins. <laughs> <laughs> so we can fix that as well. If you don't like the name, we can change it. So trying to introduce the name autodie in English to a, a bunch of Klingon programmers didn't work very well. So I wanted to call it Pujhagach which is thing which is no longer weak. It describes its effect on Perl. So to do this, all I do is declare a package, Puchagach. Um, luckily, Perl allows you to have apostrophes in package names, <laughs> which is really handy when you're programming in Klingon. We then simply inherit from the autodie module, and we're done. You don't have to do anything else. That changes the name. We're just inheriting. And then when you're doing your Klingon programming down here, I can use Puchagach, and I can open my file or die. The problem with this is that my error messages are still in English. It's still using those standard error messages. So wouldn't it be nice if I could also replace the exceptions which are used, the lewi? Well, I can do that. Lewi is actually a thing which is exceptional. It translates really well. I can do this as well. Inside my Puchagach package, which is the auto die equivalent in Klingon, I can base on autodie as before, and then I simply have to replace the exception class method and say, here's what I'd like to use for my exceptions. In this case, I'm using gach le we. And now I'm done. Of course, I need to write that actual class. So here I am writing the class. I base that on the autodie exception class, which is what autodie uses by default. And now I'm simply going to change how we do stringification. So when you get that pretty printed error message, what do you actually get? Now, rather than me simply trying to translate everything into Klingon, which I have tried and is rather difficult, instead I'm going to grab the English error message. I'm going to call the parent class and grab the typical message that I'd get. But I'm going to add a little bit of Klingon flavor to it. I'm going to use this wonderful phrase that I'm not going to try to pronounce, which means that due to your many ap apparent minor errors, <laughs> this problem occurred, Lujku, which of course is self-explanatory. Now that I've done this, I have a completely working set of Klingon exceptions in Perl. So I've got my program, I can use strict, I can use puchagach, and then I can open up a file, and if I have a problem, it says, due to your many apparent minor failures, I can't open this file for whatever reason, epic fail. <laughs> and it's going into core. So if you're using Perl 5.10.1, which you're probably not because it hasn't been released yet, you will have auto die automatically. If you're not using Perl 5.10.1 or you're not using Bleed Perl, you can actually grab it now from the CPAN for any version of Perl from 5.8 and above, which hopefully you're all using. A few things to be aware of, it is pure Perl. So there's no silly compiling, there's no futzing around with binaries or anything like that. It's 100% pure Perl. And there are no dependencies. So you don't have any sort of dependency hell where it depends upon half of CPAN. So hopefully, if you're using Autodie, you too can enjoy the very best of Klingon culture. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Kapla Bashche. I wish you all success and honor.
Yes. Um, does Perl 6 already come with these ideas of comes with a very different exception model. Um, Perl 6 comes with an idea of, by default, a delayed exception, which says that um, if you can't open a file, it gives you back a file handle, which isn't a real file handle, it's a delayed exception. And if you ever try to use that file handle as if it were a real file handle, then it actually explodes and thro throws a real exception, but it gives you all the details of where it actually originally occurred, um, which is a very, very funky concept. The reason they're doing that is to aid parallel processing that you can have like 20 CPUs all doing something at once and some of them might fail. And that doesn't mean you stop your entire program, it just means that you can weed those out at the end. Um, but you can change that. In Perl 6 you can actually say I want the old Perl 5 style of things or you actually want the, uh, the auto die style of things where you die immediately. So in Perl 6 it's, it's different again. A bit. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, I do have two talks. I, I have a quick question. Yes. In, in um, <laughs> it's shipping by Christmas. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's always a question. Um, do, 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 do. Let me just grab this. What time does my session finish? Is it 11.30? 25 minutes. Awesome. So I've got time for this. Okay. What's new in Perl 510? Um, I mentioned Perl 510. Um, in my previous talk just a little bit. Uh, just a show of hands for me, who here is using Perl 5.10? Some of you. Who here is using Perl 5.8? A lot of you. Who's using Perl 5.6? Some of you. Who's using something before Perl 5.6? Good, because I'd feel very, very sorry for you people. <laughs> um, if you don't use Perl at all, and you're wondering which version of Perl you should be going to, 5.10 is actually really good if you can get it. Um, there's actually a huge uptake for Perl 5.10 on Windows, interestingly enough, because on Windows people just go, oh, I'll grab the latest one. Whereas on a, a Unix system people tend to go, I'll go whatever's packaged with my operating system. Anyway, Perl 5.10. Um, one thing to note, Perl 5.10, cool. Um, Perl 5.10 was released in December 2007. So it's been out for just over a year now. Um, now, it's worth noting that whenever Perl has a release, if that middle number changes, so 5 point something point something, if the middle number changes, you get cool new things. So in Perl 5.6, we got sanity. I would recommend that you don't use anything earlier than Perl 5.6 for your own mental well-being. Um, in Perl 5.8, we got layers, we got Unicode, we got thread support, proper thread support. So this here is going to be talking about what we're getting in Perl 5.10. Now, before I'm telling you what's in there, I want to stress that everything in Perl 5.10 is backwards compatible. So if you upgrade to Perl 5.10, everything should still keep working. The exception is if you've got something written in C, you may have to recompile it. But all of your Perl things should all keep working in 5.10. Oh, quick question, yes? Yeah, the thing I would have problems with is Fedora 10, where site Perl's gone. Okay, grab me at the end of the class. Uh, questions at the end, if, if you don't mind. Um, so... One of the things that we get in Perl 5.10 is this. We get say. Now, say is this amazing new revolution in technology. It is print with a new line. <laughs> Which some of you might know from other languages as Printlin. Now, for some reason, it has taken Perl 17 years <laughs> for this to get into the language. We've wanted print with a new line forever, but we only got it December 2007. Why? There is, but it's evil. So, why? Why has it taken so long? The reason is because Perl promises you this backwards compatibility. We can't have you have a piece of code that looks like this. We're using speech synthesis module, we've written our own say subroutine, and then if we get locked out, we can call to our housemates and say, hey, I've been locked out downstairs. Yay, XKCD, exactly. Um, if you start using Perl 5.10, you don't want this to break. You really, really don't want this to break. So what's the solution to this? How do we promise backwards compatibility when you might have written your own subroutines which conflict with new keywords? Well, what you do is we add a new pragma called feature. The feature pragma allows you to turn on or turn off the new features of Perl. So I can say use feature say so I can now print with a new line. If I want to, I can actually ask for bundles as well. I can say use feature 510. 
give me all the new features from Perl 5.10. Or if I want to, I can actually say, use Perl version 5.10. And it says, oh, using 5.10, you're not going to be using any older version of Perl, you'll get all the new features. Or if you want to be friendly to really, really old versions of Perl, you can write use 5.010, the old style version numbers. Now, all of these use features and all of these use version numbers, again, have lexical scope. So you can turn them on just for a block of code, or you can turn them off just for a block of code. So as an example, I can use feature say, I can then say inside this subroutine, and it only affects the code inside this subroutine. So what's the big deal about say? I mean, print with a new line is nice, but why am I really going on about it? Well, the reason why it's so useful is because it saves a whole lot of errors. Um, on a very basic level, sure, it saves you some keystrokes whenever you want to write something. But um, it also saves you a lot of keystrokes and a lot of mucking around if you want to print the result of a subroutine, because you just say some function. Um, I teach Perl professionally. It's my main job. And where I find this really comes in handy is when we're dealing with contexts. People often get confused between comma and dot. One keeps things in list context. One, the other one keeps, puts things into a scalar context. So this here means I don't have to worry about that anymore. It's always in a list context. And if you don't know about context, you're really happy because you don't have to worry about it still. <laughs> it also means that you don't have to worry about using the wrong quotes, which I see my students do all the time, or the wrong slash, remembering it's a backslash in for a new line. So say is pretty cool. I'm really, really happy with say, but it's certainly not groundbreaking. So what else do I get in Perl 5.10? Well, there's a new operator. The new operator is called defined or. But uh, to save the syllables in this talk, I'm just going to call it door. Hopefully, you're already familiar with the OR operator. That's the OR operator both in Perl and C and a whole bunch of other languages. The way in which it works in Perl is like this. If I say that x equals a or b, what it actually means is x is the value of a if a is true, and otherwise x, the value, x is going to have the value of b. Now, this not only satisfies the Boolean requirements for OR, but it gives me a way of selecting a value. So I'd prefer to have A, but I'll deal with B if I have to. Very often in Perl code, you'll see something which looks like this. X equals A or B or C or 0, which says I'll take the first one of A, B or C, which are true. Otherwise, I'll take the value of 0. You also have the OR operator being used for defaults. So you might see name OR equals anonymous, which is the same as saying that name is the value of what it was previously, but if that was false, it now has a value of anonymous, which is very, very handy. Unfortunately, this style of OR has some problems. Let's pretend that I'm writing a piece of code that's going to look up prices for you know, some sort of thing where I'm selling items. So here I've got get cost. It takes an item. It looks up the cost for that item, and then it caches it. It's going to put it inside this hash so I can remember what that price was, because maybe looking up that item is very expensive. And at the end, I'm returning those. The problem is that if my items happen to be free, then I'm going to look them up every single time. Because with my look up here, it's saying that if this is a false value, and free, zero is a false value. So it's now still very slow if I want to give things away. And that's bad, because I like giving things away. To fix that, I could write code that looks like this, which, as you can see, is much, much more difficult to understand, much difficult to read. It's checking to see if it's already got a defined value. If so, it keeps it. Otherwise, it looks up the item. Now, this is where door comes in handy. The door operator looks like this. It's the OR operator that's been pushed on its side. So it's the drunken OR operator. The way in which it works, well, that's what OR looks like. This is what door looks like. It simply says, I'll take the value of A if it's defined. Otherwise, I'll take the value of B. So all of those things like 0 and the empty string, which are defined but false, well, Perl says, OK, they're defined values. They're acceptable to have them there. I'll pick those if I can get them. Now, my really awful thing here, where I'm looking for defined values and everything else, drops down to something which is much, much easier to understand. So the door operator is fantastic whenever you want to make sure that something is defined and not just true. What other things do I get in Perl 5.10? I get persistent variables. Now, we've always, always had persistent variables in Perl. If I want to write a subroutine, which in this case is called incrementer, that returns a value. And every time I call it, it gives me a value which is one bigger than the last time. What I've done is I've produced a variable called i. I've then had a subroutine which refers to that outer variable i. 
So the variable sticks around, the subroutine uses it inside, and I've wrapped the whole thing in a block so nobody else can muck with my variable. Um, those of you who are familiar with the term closure, this is a closure. The problem with this sort of code is that my subroutine's living inside a block, and it's indented. Most people expect to see subroutines on the left-hand margin of their code. I've seen some people try to write this like this, and that usually makes me violently ill. So I'm not going to show you that anymore. The solution to this in Perl 5.10 is quite simple. Perl 5.10 gives you a state keyword. And a state keyword says, I have a local variable, just like a my variable, except it retains its state. It doesn't forget what it was. So now I can say, state i begins at zero, return i++ each time, but then it remembers what i was. So I now have the same code I had before, but it's much, much more useful. In fact, I can use this with my previous subroutine here, so I can put my, uh, my lookup table, my hash cost4 inside my subroutine. And again, it's, cleaser, it's cleaner, it has better encapsulation. Now on to what I think is the best feature of Perl 5.10, and that is a native switch statement. People have wanted this for years. Perl 5.8 actually came with a module called switch.pm, and switch.pm tried to do a lot of very, very clever things. Um, the big problem with switch.pm is it was a source filter. Now, source filters, when they fail, fail in very spectacular ways. <laughs> and unfortunately, they fail in such ways that it can be very, very hard to figure out what went wrong. And they can have very, very bad interactions. So generally, I'd recommend you don't use the switch.pm module. Um, it's cool to look at, but I'd recommend you don't actually use it. Instead, grab Perl 5.10. 5.10 has a native switch statement, which is built into the language, and it's fast. It's really, really fast. To enable it, I use feature switch, or I use feature 5.10 to enable everything. Now, I'm going to show you the guessing game written using the switch statement. The guessing game says I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 100. What number am I thinking of? User says 50. I say it's higher than 50. User says 75. It's lower than 75. So to do this, I'm going to start off by enabling switch and say. I'm going to have an array of items they've already guessed, and I'm going to generate a random number between 1 and 100. Then I'm going to do some cool stuff. While I can get the guess from my user, chomp off the new line, and then given that guess. So it's not a switch statement in the traditional switch and case sense. I say given some particular piece of data when it contains things which are not integers. Say give me an integer. So I can use it to match against regular expressions. Or I can say when it's already in the list of things that you've guessed already. So I can do it to search through an array to see if the item's in there. Or I can say when it's exactly the number that I'm thinking of. I can say just right. My last breaks me out of my loop. Or I can say when it's too small or when it's too big. Inside any when statement, I can refer to dollar underscore Perl's default variable as whatever I'm considering. And my continue means that I drop down to this final bit here to record what that guess actually happens to be. So that's my guessing game written in Perl 5.10 using the switch statement. The switch statement gets even better, however, because I can also use it with a for each loop. So I enable feature switch, and then I can say for each of these cool things. And in Perl 5.10, a for each statement is automatically a switch statement if you start using whens inside it. So I can say when it matches a pirate, increment pirate, when it matches a ninja, when it matches a robot, and when it doesn't match any of these things, I can say, sorry, that's not very cool. <laughs> <laughs> it, when it gets a match, it automatically goes on to the next iteration of the loop, unless I use a continue to say, don't do that, keep matching my other options. So how does uh, switch work underneath? What's actually happening under the hood? Well, switch is actually using another new operator in Perl 5.10, and that new operator is called smart match. Hello, smart match. Here we go, smart match. Smart match is fantastic. Smart match is a generic way of saying, I have two things, do they match? So I can say, if this element x is a member of this array, very, very easy using an operator. I can say, if this variable matches this regular expression, or if anything in this array matches this, variable, this regular expression. So I can walk through a whole array and say, does anything match? Does this key exist in my hash? Or does this subroutine return a true value when given this argument? So you can give it any two things, and it will figure out what it means to smart match on them. And there's a great big table in the documentation. The best thing is, you can also put them in reverse. 
So it doesn't matter as to the order. They work the same way forward and backwards. In fact, you can overload the smart match operator if you're writing an object. So you might remember my last talk, I was talking about auto die. When you're working with auto die, you can actually say use auto die, do a bunch of stuff, and then you can say if my exception matches open, if it was thrown from the open subroutine. Or I can say given my exception, when it matches open, when it matches the class of IO objects. So it's very, very handy if you're working with objects as well, because I can define what smart match means. What other neat things do I get in Perl 5.10? Well, I get some cool things I can do with file tests. File tests in Perl normally look like this. If it is a regular file and it is a, ooh, if it is a regular file and it is a zero length file, not an executable file, and it is writable, then I'm going to delete that file. So I want to delete files which are empty and which are writable for me. Now, I could write this, uh, but if you know Perl a little bit well, you might realize that there's a shortcut I can use. I can use this special underscore file handle. Underscore means whatever the last thing was that I tested. The cool thing you get in Perl 5.10 is what people in Bash have wanted for ages, the ability to do this. I can clump all of my file tests together, which makes my code much, much easier to read and understand. 5.10 also gives you better looking error messages. Oh, how do I? Thank you. Oh, it's still working. Cool. It also gives you better looking error messages. So if you've ever been using Perl and you've tried to do something like this, dear name, thank you for buying thing for amount, and you've got some sort of a problem, you've got one of your variables being undeclared in there, or undefined, Perl gives you a, a really useless message that says use of uninitialized value in concatenation or string. Thanks, Perl. Which one was undefined? Perl 5.10 tells you undefined value name which is it's surprisingly useful, particularly when you have a big batch program that comes up with one of these things. Now, I know that I'm running out of time, so I'll go through this next bit a little bit quickly. Um, there are some new regular expression features in Perl 5.10, and I'm talking about these tomorrow. So you can actually have named, what? Where's my stuff? There you go. You can have named parentheses, and then you can refer to them by their names in your code, which is really cool. And I don't know why these are going backwards, but they are. There's also some neat folding. So um, if I've got a match where I'm looking for a bunch of things, food, foot, full, full, or foobar, Perl 5.10 goes, oh, what you actually wanted is to search for this, the string foo plus one of these possible extensions, which is much, much faster than Perl 5.8. There's, there's also a pluggable regular expression engine. So if you don't like the regular expression engine which is used by Perl, you can change it. This is really, really handy because if you happen to have a Perl compatible regular expression, which amazingly is not Perl compatible, you can use <laughs> the um, Perl 5 compatible regular expression library. Now, there's lots more stuff that you get in Perl 5.10. I'll be talking about some of that tomorrow at my next talk. But to give you an idea, here's a whole bunch of things that you also get that I haven't talked talk to you about. If you want to learn more about that, you can read the release notes. Hop over to CPAN, type in Perl 510 Delta, you get all of them. And of course, I'm also giving a talk tomorrow morning at 11.40 in the lecture theatre through there. Um, just one last reminder, there is also a Perl Boff tonight. We are meeting at the fountain at 6 p.m. I'd love to see you there. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Do we have time for questions? Five minutes. Five minutes. Awesome. Any questions? The big list, yes. This is not a complete list. Da, 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 da. Yes. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. See you around the conference.